Jeff Tracy has crash-landed on a remote island after overshooting his original destination. He has been nursed back to life by the faithful Carano and his daughter Tintin. And after witnessing another disaster at sea, his five sons, Scott, Virgil, Alan, Gordon and John, are flying out to Singapore to retrieve him. He says his goodbyes to Tintin and Carano and thanks them for their help. On the way home, he explains the idea of international rescue to his sons, who are all keen to be involved. After some rest, Jeff is determined to get to work. He first needs to secure a base, and as he sifts through plans and blueprints, he has an idea. The island he crash-landed on during his moon training missions would be the perfect place. In no time at all, Jeff, Scott and Alan are flying out to the South Pacific to start surveying the island. Jeff finds a cabin and starts to imagine how it might be turned into a hangar for a large freighter. Alan has a nasty fall, but Scott comes to his aid and he comes out relatively unscathed. They survey the rest of the island, and both Scott and Alan agree that this would make an ideal base. They fly home, and Jeff organizes meetings in all corners of the world. In each city, specialists are recruited to the cause of international rescue. In New York, construction and legal. In Sydney, architecture and electrical engineering. In Toronto, communications and electrical. In Paris, civil engineering and interior design. But the most vital member of the international rescue team was still to be traced. And Jeff remembered the gifted young student Brains, who had graduated Tracy College not long ago. He traced Brains to London, where he was giving a lecture. Jeff listened with fascination, and afterwards approached him to join the international rescue team. After some discussion, Brains finally agreed, and a week later he and Jeff were at the Tracy Aerospace plants. The time goes swiftly, and with components supplied by hundreds of unconnected manufacturers, construction on rescue aircraft moves along at pace. Then, at last, the first of the new machines is ready. It rolls out of the hangar, with Scott Tracy at the controls. He takes off igniting the high-performance sustainer rocket, pushing the craft forward at speed. Just as Scott begins to enjoy the test flight, Jeff warns him of a heavy storm rolling in and tells him to return to base. As the machine heads back for base, it's suddenly hit by lightning. Scott spirals out of control, crashing towards the ground. Back at the Tracy Aerospace Airfield, Alan and Jeff ask Brains if Scott could eject but Brains has a ground-to-air control system to try out. He successfully takes over control of the machine, but it's too late. Although he manages to get the nose up, the machine still crashes to the ground. The crash tenders arrive, and Jeff is sad to see the first test flight end in disaster. But Brains seems to disagree. The new alloy metal has stood up well to the lightning, and Scott is hauled from the cockpit with no injuries. At the debriefing, Scott jokes that after being hit by lightning, the rocket became a real thunderbird. It strikes Jeff that these should be the names of the rescue craft going forward. Three weeks later, a modified, finalized version of Thunderbird 1 is ready for takeoff. And it blasts off for the sky. Meanwhile, excavation work starts on Tracy Island to house the large, heavy transport craft to be known as Thunderbird 2. The Tracy Villa at the top of the island is also under construction, and Brains tells Jeff and Virgil that Thunderbird 2 is ready for a test flight. In no time at all, Virgil is at the controls, piloting her successfully through the skies. At the Tracy Corporation Flight Test Center, a finalized Thunderbirds 1 and 2 are ready, whilst Thunderbird 3 nears completion in a nearby hangar. 
The time has come to ferry the new aircraft to their new home in the South Pacific, now officially referred to by Jeff and the boys as Tracy Island. When they arrive, Jeff gives Scott and Virgil a tour of the island. Speed of launch will be vital. Both Scott and Virgil will have direct access to their machines from the lounge. They head to Thunderbird 2's hangar, where Thunderbird 4, a submarine, is having finishing touches applied. As Virgil gets to grip with the pod system, Gordon takes Thunderbird 4 for a spin off the jetty. The action moves offshore as they test Thunderbird 2's ability to pick up a pod off the water. Suddenly there's a fault in the buoyancy system and Thunderbird 4 starts sinking. Thunderbird 2 races to the spot where she went down, but the pod latches fail. Pod 4 falls out of Thunderbird 2 and crashes down onto the island, grazing the side of the Tracy Villa as it goes. Meanwhile, Gordon leaves Thunderbird 4 on the seabed and swims to the surface. Scott and Alan meet him in scuba suits and they head underwater to fix Thunderbird 4. It doesn't take long before Thunderbird 4 floats back to the surface. Despite the setbacks, Jeff tells his sons that they've been given permission to build a space station. Thunderbird 5 is go. With Thunderbird 3 finished, they are able to take it on his maiden flight to assist in the construction of Thunderbird 5. Jeff, Alan and John Tracy take up launch positions and liftoff is successful. A series of exhaustive flight checks are carried out as she continues out of the stratosphere. The skeleton of Thunderbird 5 is soon in view. The scores of expert space engineers and technicians employed to construct the satellite are unaware of the eventual purpose of the new space station. To them, it is just another interesting project. Under the supervision of Jeff, Scott, Alan and John, Thunderbird 5 is soon complete. And international rescue is finally operational. But there is still one missing piece of the jigsaw. As Jeff and Brains fly to London to view the unveiling of the new Fireflash airliner, that Tracy Aerospace helped to build, he finds time to visit a stately home not far from the airport. Lady Penelope Crichton Ward is an old acquaintance of Jeff, and she welcomes him. Penny has not realized that her latest undercover investigation has been a test set up by Jeff. She is to be lead amongst the international rescue agents across the globe. Continuing on around the world, Jeff stops off at Singapore where he had his crash landing, now some months ago. Meeting up with Carano, who nursed him back to health after his crash, Jeff invites him and his daughter Tintin to stay on Tracy Island. He is delighted to accept the offer, and as a university graduation treat, Tintin has a place on board the first commercial flight of the new Fireflash airliner. With the international rescue list of very important people nearly complete, Jeff returns to Tracy Island, where one final arrival greets him. He is pleased to welcome his mother to the team, fondly referred to as Grandma by the boys. Back in London, Tintin is about to fly on board the maiden flight of the new Fireflash aircraft. She is on her way to Tokyo, and will after be travelling to Tracy Island. It will not be long before International Rescue carry out their first mission. For in order to obtain the secrets of international rescue, the Hood has planted a bomb on the Fireflash, which will force the Thunderbirds out into the open. But will the Hood get his wicked way? Or will international rescue save the day?